Good afternoon. Good well, afternoon. my name is James Cayley, and I am the curator here at Owl's Head. Uh, I've been a volunteer here for many years, and the opportunity came to me uh, to come on board on staff to become the curator, which for me is a, a bit of a dream job. And at my age, finding dream jobs is that's a pretty neat experience. Uh, I'm fortunate to be working with Jonah, uh, who's also uh, on staff. Jonah is our librarian at the museum. Um, he's very good at what he does, and he's going to be filming this little um, uh, display that we do for you, this little presentation. Um, this is our third and final uh, lecture series for the winter. We try to fill in the winter months with activities. And as you can see, today we had a, uh, a STEM day for the kids. Uh, we've also had an open hood day today where we've had volunteers stationed around the museum to talk about um, specific vehicles that we've pulled out from behind the ropes and then uh, allowed you to go through uh, and get more detail on them than you uh, normally would on a regular museum day. So, uh, like I said, this is our, our third time doing this this winter. It's been a, a very good success for us. Gets people a chance to get out of the house. Uh, although sunny day today, I'm wondering why you're all here. Um, but we appreciate you coming out. We, we very much appreciate you. We have a very special uh, vehicle to talk about today. And this is actually our third very special vehicle in our series. Um, if you've missed the two previous presentations, we started our winter lecture series with uh, what we refer to as the Longfellow Rolls. Uh, Alice Longfellow was the daughter of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Uh, and she um, was a very strong woman uh, in an age where that wasn't necessarily appreciated. And Rolls Royce um, uh, was the uh, producer of a vehicle that we still have in our collection today, that we, uh, it's one of our favorites. It's an operational vehicle, uh, and it has an absolutely amazing story, and we were able to uh, tell that story in, in one of these lecture series. Uh, that car is on display out on the floor, so if you do have some time this afternoon, go out and take a look at it. It's also a very beautiful, very significant car. The second vehicle uh, that we had as a lecture subject uh, is also here at the museum. It's in the... Um, uh, the engine room or the energy room. I like to correct people and say it's an engine room, but that's just my personal preference. Um, it's referred to as the Hood Steamer. And it's a very unique vehicle. It's 1901 steam car, which in 1901 steam cars took up uh, probably about a third of the automobile market. So it wasn't unusual back in the day, except it was designed by an electrical engineer. And he had some new ideas about controlling steam engines. The hood steamer that we have was his second prototype. Uh, it is here. It's in the engine room. And we also have a film loop playing of how that automobile was brought out of the darkness, brought back into the light just recently. Uh, and um, we had a, a professional... Uh, filmographer put together a nice film that we're showing with the museum so you don't have to listen to me tell the story of the hood steamer you can watch that a film loop in there it's about uh, 15 minutes long uh, I highly recommend it which brings us to our third vehicle of our lecture series winter lecture series and this if you don't know already is Clara Bow I know it's an automobile but we very affectionately refer to this car as Clara Bow because the very first owner of the car was the silent film actress Clara Bow. The It Girl, arguably Hollywood's first sex symbol, so a very significant figure um, in our uh, American history. And would it shock you to learn that this is actually an American car? This automobile was built almost in its entirety here in the United States. In 1921, Rolls-Royce demand, the demand for Rolls-Royce vehicles, especially in this country, exceeded their capacity. These were hand-built automobiles. So Rolls-Royce established a facility here in the United States to produce vehicles for this market. 
And they established that facility in Springfield, Massachusetts. They chose Springfield because Springfield at one time was the manufacturing hub of this country. The skill sets that were there, the labor pool that was there, the precision machining that was there uh, uh, is what convinced Rolls-Royce that this is where we need to put our factory. Precision machining uh, was late to arrive in the automotive industry. Precision machining was developed in the armaments industry, the gun makers. They're the ones who really turned it into an industry, precision machining. There are several key figures in automobile manufacturing history in this country who came from the uh, arms manufacturing and they brought with them precision machining. Um, uh, so Rolls-Royce wanted that right from the get-go. They didn't really want to have to train the workforce to their standards. So Springfield, Mass. is where it was set up. Uh, it only ran for um, about 10 years, from 1921 to 1931. And in that time, they built uh, roughly 12 or 1300 of this particular model of Rolls-Royce. This is Rolls-Royce Phantom. The Phantom was the model. Actually, I'll correct myself. This is the new Phantom. Rolls-Royce needed a successor to the Ghost the Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost or Rolls-Royce Ghost, which was their stock in trade for many, many years. This was the evolution of the Ghost into the next generation. It was referred to by Rolls-Royce as the new Phantom. It was shortened subsequently to Phantom in uh, public lexicon. And subsequently to that, now that there are many generations of Phantoms out there, these are, have been uh, backdated to Phantom One, the first generation of Phantom. The thing is, Rolls-Royce never used the term or name Phantom One. What they actually used was the term New Phantom. So this is a Rolls-Royce New Phantom produced in Springfield, Massachusetts. And it's the uh, Derby Touring body style. It's a bit of a hot rod, if you have to admit. It's a pretty sharp car, pretty sleek looking car. Um, the Derby was a, actually a production type product. One of the things Rolls-Royce needed to do was to speed up delivery on their automobiles. When you ordered an automobile from Rolls-Royce, many of you probably know this, what you got was the automobile up to about here. No fenders, you got the radiator, the radiator shell, the hood, the engine drivetrain, a milk crate, and a steering wheel. There was no bodywork back here. In fact, they kind of look like those old U-Haul trucks you see for sale, where they've taken the, the box off the back of it, and it's just the cab of the truck and the chassis. That's what Rolls-Royce sold. That chassis was shipped to a coach builder, and the coach builders were remnants of the horseless carriage industry, a carryover to that. The coach builders would then build you any body, they, uh, any body type you wanted or could afford. They could customize it. They had a stock catalog, but then they could change all of that. Rolls-Royce, when this Phantom was produced, they purchased the Brewster and Company, which was a coach builder, an American coach builder located on Long Island City, New York. So you could actually, at this time, go to Rolls-Royce and say, we want a Phantom. We want it painted cream color, red leather interior. How soon can we have it? Because the Americans, very impatient, very crude to the English, very impatient, but they wanted the car. Never mind waiting a year to have it built, they wanted it now. This was Rolls-Royce's response, to have a relatively stock-bodied automobile ready to go at a fairly short notice. Um, so it's a very significant automobile from that perspective. It's how Rolls-Royce was changing their marketing uh, approach, uh, especially for the American market. It was mostly new money they were going after. Um, the Ghost was still in production when uh, the Springfield factory was set up. In fact, the first cars for several years were produced uh, as Rolls-Royce Ghosts. The Phantom was introduced in 1925, 26, something like that, mid-20s. Mid um, we're in the 20s now, right? So things are booming. 
things are going very well. This car was built in 1929. That's a bit of an ominous year. Very ominous. But things were going very well. Um, many of Hollywood's elite had Rolls Royce Phantoms. They were the new Rolls Royce. Hollywood is all about the new thing. Um, so many um, Hollywood bigwigs had these cars or actually gifted these cars. Um, uh, the Rolls factory in Springfield produced about 12 or 1300 of these over a five year period. So they were still essentially handmade, hand produced. Um, there's very little, if, there's no plastic on these automobiles. This is all before the age of plastic. Even the Bakelite that you might find is, is very limited in use, mostly all metal. Um, so yeah, we don't, we really don't build them like we used to, for sure. Um, uh, it is a large car. Anybody guess on what this car weighs, roughly? I see, I see two six, I see two sixes. With some people on board and a full tank of gas, yes, you're over three tons. So that's a big car, although you could go to your local Ford dealer, where is he? Your local Ford dealer and plop down, what, six figures and drive off with an F-350 that easily weighs 6,000 pounds. So we've come full circle, really, we have. But yes, for a passenger car that is a wheelbase of about 12 feet, which is remarkable, um, it's, it's about a, a three-ton automobile going down the road. How much horsepower? Got to have a lot of horsepower. Not even 100. That's correct. The model designation in the official Rolls-Royce model <laughs> designation, the previous ghost was the 40 slash 50 model. What does that mean? Well, the Brits were very big on taxing the automobile. So the 40, that first number, represents the taxable horsepower of the engine. The 50 represents roughly what the engine was capable of actually producing. It can't be a very big engine with only 50 horsepower. How big is this engine? Some of you drove up in two liter automobiles. Some of you drove up in six liter pickup trucks. This is 7.7 .7 liters. This is 468 cubic inches. That's a big engine. But why only 50 horsepower? RPMs. At 2300 RPMs, this engine is right in the corner. It's doing everything it can do. It has iron pistons. It has a very long stroke, large connecting rods. It doesn't like to rev. It's not a race car engine. It's an engine built to last literally forever. So it's a very relaxed power production. So yes, 50 horsepower. The reality is going down the highway with the modern gas and things, we're probably pushing over 100 horsepower today if we were to put one of these things on the dynamometer. But back in the day, the British, in their infinite wisdom, they taxed automobiles based on the area of the piston in the engine, the piston area which is wrong. Every engineer in the world will tell you that's the wrong way to do it. But the British Taxation Office established that for taxing the power of an automobile engine. It, it doesn't work. It does not work. You have to be able to account for the cubic capacity of the cylinder, not just the area of the piston. So what that did is that drove designers, engine designers, to make engines with very small diameter pistons and to be able to get that cubic inch displacement where all the power was, they went to extremely long strokes. And that's what we have here. We have a classic British inline six. This is a six cylinder engine. This is not a V8. An inline, this is an inline six cylinder engine. Um, somebody talking about my Uh oh. <laughs> I'm in trouble. And you and folks. You are in trouble. This is my engagement story that I can tell about. You folks are in for a treat. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Give me one second. Is, well, that, is that real? It is very real, yes. I'm, I'm going to stand over here and be very quiet. Oh, oh very quiet. Yes. Um, oh, Does it bite? Mic. Can I grab the mic for me? Yes. Okay. 
I'll let you do that. Okay. It's very old. So I was very thankful that James got to come in here and tell y'all about my engagement story. But now I get to tell everybody a little bit about Clara Bow's history and life and how you might think that it is a glamorous life and a glamorous story, but with every glamour story comes hardship and um, a lot of different things that people were not quite aware of. So I'm going to start with actually turning this on so that way you can see the visuals and the pictures potentially. There goes. Sorry, guys, give me one second. All right, so this is the Clara Bow story. As F. Scott Fitzgerald said, this girl was the real thing, someone to stir every pulse in the nation. So she was the it girl, and we're gonna get to really identify what the it girl was here in a few minutes, but she swooped the nation. She changed opinions. She really let women's sexuality and just independence radiate through movies, through fashion, through enjoying their own bodies and personality, as well as getting to be the forefront of Hollywood. She was an amazing person. So we're going to start it off with the early years, the early years. So every story, like I said, has a beginning. And Clara's was not one that one um, anybody can really take lightly. She was born into a very poor family. They lived in Brooklyn, but they lived in the ghetto of Brooklyn. Um, and during that time in the 1920s, there was a lot of people crammed into really small spaces. So you were living on top of each other. You were living with just a bunch of other people. And it was hot. They didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have anything to just keep the airflow going. So it got really hot and steamy and smelly and just disgusting in there. And her dad was a unemployed waiter or um, yes, unemployed waiter and busboy and everything along those lines. And so he would go and he would disappear for a spurt amount of time. He would come back um, and he would just be gone and leaving her with her mother, Sarah. Sarah is a unique character. Sarah is this woman right down here. Sarah um, developed schizophrenia and she also had um, epilepsy. And so she during that time, no one really knew what those diagnoses were, and so they, things would just happen. There is one encounter where Clara Bow is just sleeping, and her mother um, awakens Clara in the middle of the night with a butcher knife hanging over her head. And Clara wakes up, and she's extremely startled. And her mom is like, you cannot become an actress, because Clara ha at that time expressed that she wanted to become an actress. And her mother was like, all actresses go to hell. And so Clara was just like, extremely terrified so she went and she locked herself up in her room and just completely got, was terrified of her mom and her mother's side has a history of going to asylums and getting um needing help sarah's mom went to an asylum and so eventually robert came back and robert um, is the father put sarah in the asylum and made sure that clara was somewhat okay now, Robert was not a great dad. Robert was somebody that would pop up here and there, but he was also a very abusive person. So it was not really great to choose either your mother that would hold a butcher knife over your head or your father that, you know, would not treat you the kindest either. So poor Clara kind of had a rock and a hard place to grow up in. So she needed an escape. Most people need escapes during those types of environment. And where do you guys think she went? to the movies. She loved the movies. That was her place to escape and just forget everything bad that was happening in her life. So she went to the cinema and there she was captivated by the actresses and she went home and in her mirror, like we all do as kids, she recreated scenes and recreated skits that she would go and see while she was at the movie houses. And that really ignited her passion to want to become an actress. And so the more she reenacted it, the more she was getting excited about it. So her father was around for a little bit of time, and she saw that there was a um, uh, there was a photo um, sorry there was a photo challenge, and so she didn't have any money at the time. So she went to her father, and her father gave her fifty cents. And with that fifty cents, she went and got her photo professionally done, so she could submit it in this photo challenge. The award during this photo challenge was that she got to become um, a part of a movie. 
And so this movie, however, unfortunately cut every scene that she was in um, whenever it first initially aired. But a few years later, they reclaimed it and she went into the um, final cut. And so therefore she got her kick off to the world. And she was very, very excited. Um, all right, so our next one is going to be the working girl. So after she got discovered, she was beyond excited. She was like, oh my gosh, today is the day we're going to go. So she got signed after being in that little movie to go over to the East Coast um, with preferred uh, production. And so they went over there and it wasn't her and her family, it was just herself. And so she went over and she became, um, she had a, represent a representative through that company and it was BP Schulberg. And so therefore he was the one who kind of says he like discovered her and put her into the things and everything. He took one look at her and he was like, you don't need to do any screen tests. You're just gonna go right on in and you're just gonna act and you're gonna do great at everything that you need to do. So she was like, all right, that sounds good. Um, she decided to just take all of her personality and she looked very innocent and very eager. And so she used that in a way that would give her advances. And so she knew what she was working for. She didn't just go there and pretend to be this meager girl from um, Brooklyn. She came to conquer. She came to make a name for herself. And so she used her platform in order to grow within the Hollywood scene and within the Hollywood community. And so the more she started acting, the more it just became second nature to her. So it was really exciting to be able to see her growth through the movies. And something that was very unique was that there was people that would say she would top herself. So sometimes actresses will feed off of each other and there'll be one that's better than another and so on and so forth. And then like your popularity will decrease. Hers never really did. Hers, as she would come in full guns blazing, ready to go. And she would knock one movie out of the park. She then would challenge herself to do even better than what she did in the movie before. So she just could not be tamed. Like I said, she is a very wild person. And so she became so popular or so well known that she got to win a Wampus Baby Star Award, which was a really good award during that lifetime. Um, it was for um, day actresses. And so these actresses would portray themselves as these sad kind of like hide in the corner, very emotional actresses. And Clara was like, I'm not gonna do that. I am not that person in real life and I'm not gonna be that person in my movies. And so she very much wanted the world to know her as the fun, electrifying girl that she um, portrayed to be, rather than that girl back in Brooklyn that is waiting for her mother to really be present and her father to not keep disappearing. So it was really hard for her emotionally to portray herself as this exciting person. So it was really, really amazing. So after that award, she created her persona as the sex symbol of the Roaring Twenties. So because of her enthusiasm and because she was so excited to be out and about and just really saying everything about herself, she, she did the flapper, she did the dancing, she did not hide the fact that she was very interested in um, gentlemen and that she was very excited to get to boast about what they got to do during the evenings um, that they were together. So she very much became this person that was positive. She was energetic and the world fell in love with her. And so with the world falling in love with you, there becomes a lot of demands. And so her scheduling started to go extremely crazy to the point to where she was in two years, she made 25 movies. So yes, she was with BP Schulling or Schulberg and she was really with his um, company, but he would lease her out to two other filming companies just to again, make sure that the money was coming in, but she was a hot little ticket at that time. So he was like, we're not gonna slow you down. You're gonna keep moving forward. So there was this one movie that she was in and she had to play her death scene. And so that is a very, I've never played a death scene, so I can't give you any insight on that one, but you can see how emotional she was during that. And everybody was like, well, how do you just rein in your emotion? How do you instantly start crying at a drop of the hat? And she told this story about how she would think about one of her friends from back home in Brooklyn who died in a fire. And she was like, that is just what I would pull from my memory in order to just channel my emotions. And so she was able to just cue a lot of emotions and cue a lot of really exciting times and stories in her life to channel her um, acting skills. And it was an amazing thing to be able to accomplish at that time. 
So she became the role model for the flapper generation because of how many movies she was in and because of her style and her personality. She really engaged with the public on being able to be that flapper girl. Um, people, like I was saying earlier, they were envious of her. She was able to come in and command a room. She didn't hide in the corner. She was here. But the thing is, she didn't act like a movie star. She came in and she wanted to know every single person that was on set. She wanted to know everybody around her because she was just a normal person. She wanted everybody to love her. And that really puts you forward in making that icon. So she was very, very influential to boys and girls and everybody um, along the way to the point where she had a sexual revolution. So this was five years post women finally getting to do the right to vote. And so women during that time, they were finally realizing their independence. They were realizing we can do more. We can be out there. We are these strong, very, um, very independent people. And so Clara Bow was like, um, I am not only going to be a strong, independent woman, I am going to flaunt what I have. And so she decided to flaunt everything. And she, like I said, she would come in in her skimpy outfit. She would be very flirtatious in movies. She would go up and she had multiple affairs. And all of the affairs that she would have, she would come in and she would just brag. She'd be like, this is how the life, this is the style, this is everything that we need in order to have to move forward and have that sexual revolution. And she did not hide from it in any way, shape, or form. She very much boasted about everything that she did. But however, with every woman, there always comes some love. And so we have some good stories of love via Clara Bow. But she also found love in very unique ways. So most of her movies, she's the leading lady and there's a leading role that comes with it or a leading male role that'll come with it. So she did fall in love with a few people. She fell in love with Gilbert Ronald, Victor Fleming, and Gary Cooper. So these are just three of some of the um, gentlemen that she would have on a rotating a uh, week adventurous with herself. And so she very much would go out with them, be seen out on the town, throw back the drinks, enjoy her time. And it was a really unique way to be able to say, I am allowing this. I am making this about me. This is where we are. And so, like I said, she very much became the sex symbol. Men wanted her and women envied her because of how she looked and how she was able to just smile and have everybody swoon about her. She started to become and have a bit of a reputation as um, some people would call her a little minx. And so she was, again, very flirtatious. She just wanted, she went in, and she was ready to go. And that was starting to get a little bit out of control to where, yes, the women were envious of her, but then they started to get frustrated. They were, they were angry at the fact that all men would turn their heads to Clara and lose focus on them. And so I don't know if you'll know much, but women can be very vicious sometimes as well. So therefore, there would be rumors and there would be things that would try and tear Clara down. But she rose above all of them and she was like, nope, I am here and about me. So down here is a really exciting photo. She is in her swimsuit and she put her high heels on in this swimsuit and she walks through a hotel bar and she's like, look at me. I can rise above all of the bad reputation that is around me. So the unique thing about it, it is one of her most famous movies, which is amazing. And so this actually was written, it was a racy book written by Eleanor Glenn, and she was an English-born writer, and she would write some very racy books. Um, this, however, is one of the only books that is really well known by Eleanor Glenn. So B.P. Schulberg decided he wanted to do a PR stunt. He said if Miss Glenn would proclaim Clara Bow as the it girl, then Schulberg would build a movie around the, around the book and, of course, star Clara in it, as well as give a very small part to Madame Glenn. And Madame Glenn was a bit of a snob. But she did not pass up um, an opportunity whenever it um, became, whenever it was presented. And so with this PR stunt, a very racy movie was able to be presented, but also Clara Bow proclaimed as the it girl. She was the girl that everybody was looking at. And that really, because of this PR stunt, made her who she is today. And it made all of the men fall in love with her. It made all of the women um, want to be her. And thank you to this movie, she was able to be this type of thing. So one time she did say, all of the time the flapper is laughing and dancing, there's a feeling of tragedy underneath. 
that's what makes us different. And so she wasn't just like every girl that would come in and be a movie actress and do everything about those. She was very honest. She wanted the world to know who she was through and through. And um, it was very important for her, for people to know who she really was. And so that, by definition, made her more unique and stand out than everybody that would have the same generic um, background story. However, yes comes with the demand, also comes a toll. So Hollywood, as some might know, and I'm sure you know, the um, Taylor Swift of the worlds um, out there will also know that people can ruin your reputation very, very much. So she had a scorned society. She was loved by the public, but she also was very much um, nervous of what the public would say about her. And so there were a lot of rumors that started circulating about her and circulating about the stories and the nights and the events that she would go to. So she, after all of her movies, started realizing she didn't really want to be at the premieres because, again, the rumors and tabloids and people just being very degrading about who she was as an independent person was getting to be too much. So she would stay home and she would play poker with her cook and her mates. And then there was a notorious rumor that kind of started circulating about her. She very much loved the USC football team, um, and not in a way that people might think, but however, she did have them over to her house and they would play a lot of fun games together. And so this rumor started circulating that there was more happening than what meets the eye. But her friend was able to come in and defend her because um, Clara Bow always had early morning calls. She needed to be on set, prepped, ready to go, dressed to the nines, smiled, makeup ready. So she would actually escape the parties and she would go to bed. She would, you know, just sleep and get everything that she needed to be done. And so her friend would go to bed and they would just talk and just check in and make sure. And then her friend came out and was able to say, Clarabeau is not the person that you think that she may be with this rumor. But that, again, it's very degrading to be able to have to have this image of yourself get tarnished by what people can say or think about you. Another toll of Hollywood is that everything is evolving. So silent movies, they're fantastic, they're fun, but people wanted to start hearing what was actually being said in these silent movies. So talkies started to become um, the new forefront of Hollywood. And most actresses in talkies had maybe roughly two years to start practicing and learning how to be comfortable with mics, having the beautiful voices that they did. Clarabelle had about two weeks in order to get prepped and ready to go for the next movie, which was a talkie, and she just crashed. She had a lot of panics and a lot of... Um, opinions about it that just made her super, super anxious. And so that was one of her big obstacles moving forward that made her have a lot of breakdowns because the microphone became her worst enemy. And so that was the biggest obstacle in her, um, in her future. And of course, we always wanna know about Clara Bow's love life. And so Clara Bow met Rex Bell, and Rex Bell was a cowboy movie star. And thanks to Rex, he was able to propose to me when he or drove up the Hollywood um, studio site and he delivered my Clara Bow um, Rolls Royce Phantom Tour vehicle. And so how could you not say no to an engagement present like this? I mean, nowadays we just get the ring. Back then we get the car. I mean, where, where did time go wrong? Um, and so what they were able to do was she was very showy. She loved fast, racy things. And so what would be better than a Rolls Royce? And so with that, she obviously said yes. And her and Rex Bell decided to go and get married. And people were very genuine, and they said that it was true love. You could just tell in the difference between having affairs and having um, these flirtations to your partner. And so go around set and taking care of her, he would always call her my girl as a way of an endearment, just being like, that's my girl over there. My girl is doing amazing, and she needed that. And as you can see, nothing else... Um, Nothing else except happiness and health count in life. I've never had much of either, but I'm going to find them both. If you look back at her history, her parents were absent. There was no one really there to give her the love that she needed until Rex Bell was able to come through and be that person for her. So she found it through different outlets that made her the it girl. And during that time, she had no regrets or anything. I can't speak perfectly for her, but if you are the person pursuing who you are, and having that lifestyle, she found the love where she needed to until she met Rex Bell. 
And so they got married in Las Vegas, Nevada, and then they moved out to this beautiful ranch that you see down below, and they had two beautiful boys. And so within that time frame, Clara Bow, one year after retiring, she was like, you know what, I'm going to go back and I'm going to become an actress via Fox Studios. And so she did, and they were talkies, and they were doing fine, and she conquered one more video. And then after that, she was like, she had more mental breakdowns and she had just these nervous breakdowns because of the microphone. That microphone never disappeared, but because of how she spoke and her accent and just having to be in that environment, she did not do well with the talkies. Oops, sorry. So this is the fall of the stardom of Clara Bow. And as unfortunate as that might be, she just had a lot of a mental status that took a lot of toll on her. So she became very big subjects of gossip and tabloids. And gossip and tabloids do nothing but destroy your confidence. Like, yes, you're walking out there and you're walking with confidence and you're like, I'm the strong, independent idol. But when you're back at home, like she was with that party and with that rumor, she just hid in her room. She just wanted to be away from it all. The words of people in the worlds of Hollywood, they just destroyed everything about you. And so she was having this time. And it doesn't help that there was a history of mental illness in her family. And so adding the history of mental illness and adding the pressure of the world did not really go well for her mental status. And so she did throughout life, you know, women, they, they gain and they drop weight. Um, but it got to the point where she gained 30 pounds and her custom wardrobe that they would have for her on set wasn't fitting for her. And that is a very mentally debilitating thing. Whenever you go in, you're prepped, you're ready to go, and they're like, well, we can't shoot your scene today. You don't fit in your outfit. We're going to have to figure it out. And having those words just be channeled at her can be, again, just knocking you down a few pegs. And again, that dang microphone, like the one in front of me. I personally don't like talkies either, but here we are conquering the world, me and Clara. But the, the microphone never disappeared, and she knew to move forward, she was going to have to continue talking with the talkies, and that was not something that she could mentally get behind. There were three horrific scandals um, that hit the front pages right after another. So like I said, she was a woman of many affairs, but she did, and one got very published, was her affair with a married Dallas doctor. Another um, front page scandal was her alleged gambling debt. Yes, we talked a little earlier about how she had gambling with, or she would do gambling or poker with her maid and her cook, but obviously you don't want to just do it at home when you have a lot of money and a lot of show. So she would go out and about and she would have a really, really good time. And another one was she would go to court with her friend Daisy uh, De DeVoe, I think is how you say her last name. And it was her former best friend because they accused Clara of Grand Theft Auto. But after it got all cleared up, she was okay. But being in that limelight of having a court case with your name tied next to it, again, is not very good and very, very scandalous at that time. She was starting to um, feel dropped or feel manipulated by BP Schulberg. He decided to start calling her crisis a day Clara. So every time she showed up to the venue or to um, the set, there would be something wrong. And again, it was because of her mental status of where she was mentally and unhealthy. And so she would just, anything would happen and it would set her off. She'd have a breakdown or have a mental just moment or episode. And so production was not able to continue in the way that it needed to. And so again, she got the name Crisis a Day uh, Clara. And then the Coast Reporter, which again is a, um, it is a paper company that um, dedicated to exposing Clara, charged her with, um, they went out and they said that she had a drug abuse, that she was a lesbian, that she was into um, very un, um, in, into these sexual things that are not seen in, in good light. She had a disease, she was insanity. And so by having basically a smear campaign against your name would drive pretty much anybody crazy. So these were the final straws that really just made Clara Bow want to leave um, the society in the limelight of Hollywood, which she did thanks to the help of Rex Bell. She did, however, pass away um, due to a heart attack at her home. And then um, her husband, Rex Bell, continued on um, his path in the limelight of trying to go for Congress. But that is the history of Clara Bow, and she is a very influential person in history for the 1920s. And I hope that you've enjoyed today's What Drives Us. Any more questions?
There is a biography. Um, it is called Clarabeau Runnin' Wild. Um, I don't remember who it's by, but you can find it, I believe, on Amazon. Yes, ma'am. I believe it was her real name. Um, her uh, father's name was Robert, though, so I would say that I would believe that. Yes, ma'am. Yes. She was 16. And she pretty much left Hollywood at 25, so about 10 years. Yes. Um, that I'm not a, I'm not sure of. I apologize. Do you know? Yes. 65. Yes. Thank you all very much. Any other questions? Well, if you haven't gotten the chance, I encourage you guys to please walk around and check out the Clarabeau Phantom. Um, it is a beautiful car. And so there's actually a very cool, which I'm sure you told them about, the um, bar in the back, because again, she was a fun girl. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, now you know what, I'll pass it back to you and you can finish telling the um, interior of the car if you guys would like to walk around and finish kind of seeing what's out there. But uh, thank you all very much. <laughs> Uh, no, everyone.